Here we go. Here we go. I want to talk about today, and to get my little notebook out. Um, we wanted to go into the lesson, and I don't know about you, but yesterday really, really blessed my life. Um, it was such, such a powerful word from the Lord um, as it relates to us standing in the integrity of our dream. And after I got off yesterday, um, my spirit was uh, literally set on fire as it relates to um, the integrity of your dream. Um, I have a testimonial. Um, there was a young lady that um, uh, texted me today, and she was saying that, and this is what gave me the idea to... Um, go ahead and put up this email for you all to give me responses. She texted and said that um, she had made the decision after, um, after listening to the broadcast on yesterday. Uh, she got off the broadcast. She was going into acting. She made the decision that I'm not going to give up on my dream. I'm going to stand the integrity of my dream. I'm going to continue to pursue my dream. And she sent out some fillers right after the broadcast was over. And in her fillers, she sent out fillers to, um, to get into auditions for a few movies. And she said, and I waited all night, and I waited, you know, all night and nothing, you know, up until the evening. I, I, I sat up and I waited and nothing. And she said, and lo and behold, about two hours ago, she got a letter back from one of the tele one of the movie producers and said, I remember who you are and you don't have to audition. I want you in my movie. I just want you to come in and read the part. That's what I'm talking about. When you get prepared, the opportunity is already there. It doesn't know which door to knock on. If it's knocking on a door that you see what I just did a few minutes ago. And that's a perfect example. I mean, what if opportunity came and knocked and I was talking about, oh, wait a minute, I got to get my coffee. Oh, wait a minute. And so, and here on this phone, um, the knock uh, was not necessarily a verbal sound, but the knock was just an appearance on the screen. I would have missed it. I would have missed it. You know, I forgot my coffee was in, you know, the, 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 the microwave, but you know that, but who's going to want to hear that? I, I forgot. Who's going to want to hear that? So that was a prime example, people, that all of it has to be tight. All of it has to be tight. You have to be prepared to step into the dream. Remember I said yesterday, you have to prepare yourself with integrity and keep looking over your shoulder as if it's right there. As if the opportunity is right behind you. And in a split second, you're going to miss it if you turn your eyes away from your vision. So... With that being said, let me get my pen here. Um, with that being said, um, I jotted down a few things that I felt was very, very um, important for our lesson today. Dreams. Where do I stand in the dream? What is my posture? Where should I posture myself when I am in my dream? When my dream is evolving into a manifestation of reality, where should I be? Where should I be? Well, I ran across a couple of things and, and, and some things was mulling over my head and it came to me. Uh, I heard in my spirit, I am Alpha and Omega. I am Alpha and Omega. When you start thinking about God being Alpha and Omega, he is two entities. And, and, and both of those entities can never be erased. Alpha, he's the beginning, and Omega, he's the end. He's the beginning, he's the end. He's the beginning, he's the end. So watch this. A lot of times we view this thing called the past as being something that, you know, well, if I look at it like somebody telling me, you know, you can't live in the past, you can't stay in the past, you know, how detrimental is the past to my vision? We want to relate that to the negativity of the past or something that happened in your past that has an um, uh, inability to make you feel some sort of kind of way um, 
and not in a good way, but in a bad way. And you would be surprised at how many things we can't get done when we allow ourselves to go and take a trip back into the past. And I'm gonna tell you why that's dangerous. It's not only dangerous because it's a negative place, but it's dangerous because it sits in a place that you've already come through. I'm gonna say that one more time. The past sits in a place that you've already come through. If God is Alpha and Omega, you keep going back to the beginning of something because just because something happened negative for you, uh, to you, doesn't mean it was negative for you. Because when you encounter trouble and trouble is based on negativity, then you have to understand that that situation just became a gift to you. I'm going to let you think about that. That's a gift to you. You don't realize it yet, and I'm talking to somebody today. You don't realize that what just happened to you, it's really happening for you. And it is a gift to you because when you look up the word trouble, and I think I'm going to give this definition to probably the day I die. When I had an opportunity to look up the word trouble, the word trouble said, when something is out of order, and it was at that point that the revelation hit me that when trouble comes, it is a gift from God giving you an opportunity to put that which was out of order in order. Did you hear that? It is an indication that something, there's something about the way that you are handling this, something about the way you're dealing with it, something about the way you're trying to, um, you, you're trying to construct your dream is out of order because trouble will always come and present itself as a gift, as a messenger to you to let you know that there is something out of order. And if it keeps being trouble, then that means it keeps being out of order, which let me tell you what's happening to you now. You're being constantly taken back to the beginning and you can never reach the future because you always at a starting point. You think about the Olympics, who would win a race if every time they fired the gun, the person would st start off running and turn around and go back and, and, and kneel down again and, and just and say, I'm, I'm, I'm propping myself up to run again. Because that's exactly what you do. You do not ever allow yourself to get beyond your beginnings. Your beginnings. Because you allow that which is called the past to take you back to the starting line. And so now you're in a vicious, repetitious cycle that you cannot get out of because you always feel like I'm starting over. I'm, I'm starting over. I'm starting over. And you cannot be there because the scripture says, the Bible says, and I'm not, I'm not one in these empowerment lessons to, to bombard you with a lot of, you know, because how many times have we read the Bible? We don't read the Bible until our Bibles is raggedy. Many of you are looking right now. You didn't read the Bible and gone through two and three Bibles. The Bible's raggedy. So is more scripture what we need? Or is it the manifestation to prove that the scripture do work? So now we got to work the scripture. We can't just keep reading it. Because it is divine instructions and it is a guideline which uh, is to be carried out by individuals who only understand the power of the word prudent. The Bible says that God dwells with a prudent man. The spirit of the Lord will dwell with prudence. And when I had an opportunity to look that word up, let's go to it. Let's look at it. Let's do it together. Because I don't want you to think I'm over here making something up. Because you just said that. No, no, no. Now we, now we get, in, now we get into that, to that thing. You know, have you ever felt like you have a rubber band that's holding your dream and you try, you're trying to pull this way and something is pulling you back that way and it just feels like a stretch and it's like, a, mm, mm, like that, that, mm, mm, like, and, and you have to press so hard to keep yourself stretched out to the point that you feel like you're making some headway. But as soon as you hit an emotional moment, an emotional crisis moment, you don't have the strength to press against the rubber band. So now you just you just thrown back and you're thrown back to where it was. And that is because how you are operating, you're trying to operate. You're trying to operate an emotion about your dream. 
You trying to rely on your emotions to get you to your dream. And that is a dangerous place to be. You cannot, you cannot put a demand on your emotions to get you to your dream. Are you hearing me? Because your emotions change hourly, daily. For some of y'all, secondly, I'm sorry to say that. You know, one minute you this way, and the next minute you that way, and one minute you depressed, and the next minute you full of joy, and one minute you up, and one minute you down, and you just all over the place. You're all over the place. And so if you put your dreams and the stability of your dreams and the future of your dreams on your emotion, you're an accident waiting to happen. You're a train wreck with no horn. They don't even see it coming. You don't even see it coming. It says here that prudence is wisdom, judgment, common sense, shrewdness, advisability. Are you, hear, are you hearing this? Recklessness. People who operate in the spirit of prudence, they operate in advisability to themselves. They know how to take up counsel with themselves. They know how to sit with themselves and, and bring all of them, mind, body, soul, and spirit into counsel, into the counsel of the Lord, into the counsel of the God that's in me. I know I'm all emotional right now, but we got to go to counseling and we got to counsel with us and we got to find out why am I out of sorts here? Because I want to tell you something, whatever affects you from without is because there's something about it. It has found an identification with you inside. Jesus said, scripture, here we go, Bible, that the prince of this world cometh, but he finds none of him in me. So when people can get you all out of sort, it's because there's something about what's in you that have made a connection with all of that negativity. And so then you have to stop and bring yourself into counsel and say, what is it in me? What is it that is going on inside of me that caused somebody with two likes on their page to affect me like that? Oh, I'm speaking some truth today. I'm speaking some truth today. No, you got to consider the source. Before you start getting your emotions all bent out of shape about what somebody say about you, you got to go back and look at who they are. Somebody got one likes, two likes, then the biggest time that you'll ever be heard is on my page. And why do you let people like that take you out of sorts? I don't. Many of you all have said, well, well I don't know how she handled it. People talk, about, people talk about me every day. Because success is about numbers, it's not about feelings. When Hollywood get ready to make their decision, they don't make their decision on what people feel about you. They make their decisions based upon how many numbers have been ac accumulated about you. I, I think y'all hearing what I'm saying. I think you hearing what I'm saying. No, it's a good thing. It's all a good thing. Because you can, that's the only way you can understand the power of who you are by who's talking about you. I'm saying something to somebody right now and you got to get this because this is the wagon that keeps allowing you to fall off. This is the one right here and it's an empty wagon. You taking a ride on an empty wagon being bumped all over the place and before you know it, you and your dream is down on the ground and you back at the starting point. You back at the starting point because you don't know that all of it is good news. All of it says that you contain enough power that you on somebody's mind. You have taken somebody's thought pattern for the few minutes that they spend talking about you. They are no longer in control of their own mind. Think about that. Think about that. The next time the devil tell you how powerless you are. Okay. Wisdom. Prudence is wisdom. It is judgment. It is good judgment. It is common sense. It is recklessness. It is caution. It is care. It, watch this. Watch this. It is caution and it is care. So let's help us right now with this emotional part. So then, Dr. Biden, what happens to me? You know, um, what is it that, how, how am I exposed to this kind of stuff? Because first of all, you have to take caution at the people that you hang out with. You have to take caution with who you sit down and eat with because eating is covenant. You have to be cautious about now how, how do you take caution? How do you know that you're being cautious about 
what sits around you because the majority of the times what sits around you will end up in you. I just said something right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The kind of people that sit around you, you'll end up with that kind of mindset. And whether you think it's happening or not, it is. It really is. That's happening to you while you're sitting there talking. So then I must become conscious of my surroundings. I must look around my surroundings and say, now, what do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? What, do, what are you working on? And what are you working on? And what are you working on? And you look around and this one right here is, is, is still sitting at home, you know, cooking grits. And this one right here and got their head tied up talking about let's go to the club. And this one over here talking about, you know what, I, don't, I just don't know. What. So then you got a whiner on your hands. You need to get a whiner's back their name. You got a whiner's on your name. You just, you just whining about everything, whining about what ain't going right, whining about what you can't get fixed. And, uh, and so now you become the audience for the whiners. You become the audience because they want to feed you. You become the audience because they want to hang out and, and, and talk foolishness. And guess what? You're a person that is about focus and you're about a dream. Why are you hanging with people who have no focus and have no dreams? Because all that's going to end up happening is they're going to start sucking the vision out of you. And before you know it, you're going to start acting just like that. Well, I was going to work on it today, but... Girl, go and cook me some grits. I mean, girl, I'm hungry. Shoot, I just got to take a break. Well, I was going to work on my vision, but girl, I'm with you. Let's go into the mall. Let's, let's go on and do a cookout and have a barbecue. And when you get through eating, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to go back home. You're going to get ready for bed, and you're going to lay in the bed, and not condemnation, but conviction is going to come to you. You're not going to be able to sleep. You're going to be laying there tossing and turning because you're going to feel guilty. And why are you feeling guilty? Because what you've been given is not a good idea. It was a God idea and it was a divine thing and it's locked in divine timing and you know you just wasted time doing nothing. Okay. Okay. So then if God, if you're asking today, where is God? Where is God in my vision? Why can't I see, Lord, is you there? We love to pray that prayer. God, are you there? But look at what the scripture said. God dwells, dwells, resting place. I'm going to look that up. Mm -hmm. We're going to look that up because I, I don't want you to think that I'm just. It says dwell means the Lord resides. He lives. It says to be settled, to be housed, to lodge, to stay. Are you hearing this? Are you hearing this? So if God dwells with prudence, it is a place that he lives. It is a place you can always find him. It is a place that no matter what happens, you can always go to that place and find God. You don't have to wonder where his wisdom is. You don't have to wonder where his knowledge is. You don't have to wonder where the direction is. Well, God, I don't know what to do. Where are you? He's sitting right over here. He's where he lives. He's where he lives. He's not wandering around in your emotions. He's not wandering around in your highs and your lows. He is where he lives. If you're going to find him, if you're going to find your mother, you got to go to where she lives. Go to your father's house. Go to your sister's house. You got to go to the lodging place of God. You got to go to where he lives and he lives. He dwells in prudence. Lives. Okay, let's go back to that. Let's go back to prudence. He lives. He dwells in prudence. I'm looking for God. Go to where he lives. Go to where he lives. And where does he live? He lives in prudence. And what is prudence? He lives in wisdom. He lives in judgment. He lives in common sense. He lives in advisability. Now watch this. This is the part I love. He lives in cautiousness. He lives in care. He lives in providence. Watch this. Watch this. He lives in foresightedness. Foresight. For thought, which means people, if you don't get in your future, you won't find God. Point blank. Which means as long as you hang out in your past, 
as long as you hang out back there at what God has already done, that's where you will stay. You will stay being the person that's always either celebrating or whining in what God has already done. But you'll never be the person that go on to the future because he's in prudence and prudence is foresightedness. In other words, what you are able to see up the road, what you are able to operate in up the road. One of my instructors, when I went to dance, I was, I was taking um, some uh, new instructions by a new teacher. And he said, um, you know what your problem is? And I said, what? He said, you know, you in the mirror, some things that I wanted to do. And, I, and, and, and he said, the reason why you keep falling over when you do that, he said, because um, you're looking at yourself. I was in the mirror. I said, what do you mean? He said, turn around, look at the mirror. I turned around, I looked in the mirror. And he said, um, you see where your eyes are? And I said, yes. He said, your eyes just went to you in the mirror. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to look beyond you in the mirror. So the minute I looked beyond me in the mirror, my head went up and my eyes was no longer looking at me, but my eyes was looking beyond me. He said, you have to look beyond yourself in the mirror and not get distracted by looking at yourself, by not being distracted, by being able to be attracted to you in the mirror and let that attraction become stronger to you beyond the mirror. Are y'all hearing that? Now that'll preach right there. Because the enemy got us so busy looking at who we are that he don't want us to ever look beyond who we are into where we are going, into who we shall become, into who I shall be. Remember, give it up the X for the next, that part. Foresightedness, foresight, forethought. Which means when your thoughts start agreeing with everybody else's thoughts, even with you, then you're not in foresight. You're not in forethought. You're in the calculations of what they have summed you up to be. And is that where you're going to stay? I don't think so. I don't think so. Let me tell you about a story. I remember when I first hit Bishop Jakes' platform and I was invited. And um, the Lord began to tell me to prepare myself. I was doing conferences. I had been to the uh, uh, Pensacola. Uh, that was 7,000 people. I went back a second year. It was 10,000 people. And, um, and then right behind that, uh, the Lord told me, don't do another conference. And I had people saying to me, oh, you on the road now. You ought to, da, 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 da. You ought to, you ought to keep it moving. God said, stop. He said, don't do another conference that next year. Because my first conference that I ever did, that people told me I shouldn't do, that it wouldn't work out. Um, I did that conference and it drew close to 5,000 5, people. And so I went to the next place and the next place. And when the Lord told me to stop, it didn't make any sense to the natural eye to stop. It didn't make any natural sense because people said, well, you, you, know, you got some traction now. You just should keep going. But God said no. And I was following the foresight of the Lord. And so I stopped. And Within that year, Bishop Jake's office called me and they said they wanted me to do a class of 500 people. And so I began to prepare myself. So when I began to prepare myself, I knew what God had already prophesied to me. And so I began to get ready. Now, I went out and I got a booth. I got a booth with my picture. It was blowed up. It was about $6,000 for this booth. It was a first class booth. I went and ordered all of my product and all of that. And so I remember when the booth came, I'm trying to tell you about small minded people. When the booth came, I, my sister and I opened up the booth and we set it up in my garage and it was, it was beautiful. Some of you that follow me as long as since 1998, you would probably know, um, 1996, you would know what it looked like. And, um, I opened up the booth and it needed some light bulbs, but it was beautiful. And so we went to get light bulbs, but instead of coming back through to, to the garage, I pulled up in front of the house and came back through the living room area, through the front door and out through the kitchen. And just as I got ready to step out into the garage, I heard some friends of mine in the garage talking about me saying, oh, 
She thinks she all that. She only gonna teach a class of 500 people. Why she got all this blowed up and all this product she done ordered. And that's what I tell you about people. They just think they more than what they are. Now I'm listening to my so-called friends talk about me like that. Did it hurt my feelings? Yes. Did I go out there and say, I heard what y'all said. No, because let me help you with something. A lot of things you may hear about you as it relates to friends and people that you thought were with you. You have to keep it in your back pocket. Everything is not for you to confront. Because when you confront it, you display that you have information. And now you have no way of knowing who else is your enemies that's pretending to be your friends. Because the people that flock closest to the people that you now know is the enemy. You get what I'm saying. Now you can do a clean sweep. And it ain't got to be just one by one. It's wisdom, prudence, wisdom. No, you don't jump emotional. You know what you know, and you work with what you know. That's what I'm saying to you. That's what I'm saying to you. Eventually, eventually, they will fire themselves. Eventually, as you keep progressing, because if it is you progressing that's now got them talking negative, if you don't ever stop progressing, you're going to clean it out anyway. Mm-hmm. An empty-minded wagon can't stand another loaded wagon riding alone next to it. Yeah. Do you hear that? Yeah. That's true. That's the truth right there. I said nothing. I came on back in, I made some noise in the kitchen so that they wouldn't know I was in the kitchen or somebody was in the kitchen. I came on and got my light bulbs, lit it up. Went on to Bishop Jakes' conference. I was invited to teach a class of 500 people. After I got done teaching that first class, I said to myself, anytime anybody give me anything to do, I'm going to do it like it's the last time I'm going to do it. You don't understand. If you invite me to preach in a church with 10 people, I'm going to preach like it is 10,000 in there. Uh, people go, why is she preaching? So I'm going to preach like it's 10,000 people. You know why? Because I refuse to accept the fact once God said to me, you are called to greatness, then guess what? If God say you are called to the masses, then one of y'all 10 people in here got the masses in y'all. I'm sorry. And I'm going to preach like it's 10,000 people in here because one of y'all in here is sitting in here with greatness in here or I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be on this phone. I would not be on Facebook right now live on this video if I wasn't talking to somebody that was a world changer and a game changer. That much I do know. Greatness is on this line. God would never send a major voice to a minor issue. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. It's not his sense. It's not the common sense of the prudent one. Are you hearing me? So I know you're great. I know you're on this phone because you're great. I know you're great. I know that there is greatness sitting inside of you. I know that there's greatness sitting inside of you that you're afraid to admit it. You're afraid to admit it because you've been told for so long that you're not nothing. And you've been told, so watch this. You have perfected yourself at being number one at being number two. Now you'll catch me up there with that one up the road round the corner. You have perfected yourself at being number one at being number two. But now it's time to be number one. Now it's time for you to go get your dream. And when it's time for you to go, don't be surprised if some of the same people that you help go won't turn around and help you go. Why? Because the go got to be in you. Oh, now that right there is a reprint. You need, hashtag the goal got to be in you. Yes, it does. The goal got to be in you. The goal cannot be in nobody else. It can't be in your mama. It can't be in your grandmama. It can't be in your granddaddy. It can't be in your daddy. It can't be in your friends. If the goal was in my daddy, look, I, listen, part of my goal was in my daddy. That's why when he had a heart attack and died, I thought I was going to die too. The goal got to be in you. What God has called you to do, you got to go and collect it from everybody. Put it back in your own soul and decree and declare today that my goal is in me. It's in me. And I'm responsible for getting to where it needs to go. Nobody else. Nobody else. I'm totally responsible. I'm totally responsible to the way I communicate to God, to the God of everything.
I'm totally responsible for how I take caution at protecting what he has given me. Uh-huh. He talking right now. My foresightedness. So what did I do? I went to Bishop Jakes. I preached in that 500 people class. And if anybody was in that class that's on this page, anybody that's in this class that would listen to this video, I preached like I was standing in front of 10,000 people. And you know what my friend said? She taking all this product. She's going to be bringing all this stuff back home. Da, 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 da. And she didn't order all this product. And la, 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 all these boxes. La, you can't hardly walk through here. She's going to bring all this stuff back home because that's what people get because they think they all that. Yeah, they said all of that. And I went to that conference and I preached in that class. And that was a morning class. I got done and went to lunch. Couldn't eat. Got back to my hotel at 4.30, the phone rang, and it was Bishop Jake's assistant saying that the Lord spoke to Bishop Jake's and said, you are to preach tonight. And I went from standing in front of 500 people that morning in front of 36,000 by that night, and I brought home nothing. I sold $125,000 worth of product because I heard the go in me. I heard the go in me. I don't care what they said. I don't care what they said. I got over in the spirit of prudence and I locked into it with my teeth like an alligator and I would not let go. And that's what I'm saying to you. Some of y'all biting down on your dream like it's a sandwich. This ain't no peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You better put your teeth in this thing like this grip, like your last breath depends upon it. Until you feel that way about your dream, you will never get there. Until it's a come see, come saw, and I'll do it, and maybe, and whatever the Lord say, and we'll see what happened. No. You, you are the author of your own fate. You are in control of what happens to you. You are. You are. And the way things come out is the way you think. Because when you have that thinking process, like maybe it will, maybe it won't, then maybe it does, and maybe it don't. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that? But if you stay consistent in the integrity of this will happen, I know this is going to happen. This right here, mm -mm. this going to happen. I don't care. All right, hit a few bumps in the road, but those bumps is to tell me that I'm doing something the wrong way. Got to straighten that up. Got to fix that. But this going to happen. This got to happen. It's fail proof. No, failure is not an option here. It's not an option. Two things is not an option. Doubting God is not an option. Failure is not an option. Don't ever think like that ever again. And you have integrity to yourself. And when you have integrity to yourself, how many people want integrity to themselves? Just push yes. I'm going to wait for a few minutes. I want to see how many people are going to say, yeah, I want, I want to have real integrity to myself, Dr. Bynum. Yes, yes, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm not moving until I see at least 20 people say yes. I want integrity to myself. I want integrity to myself. Yes, yes. Here come one. Come on. Two, she put amen. I said say yes. I didn't say say amen. See, that's another thing. Instructions. 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 You have to follow instructions. Because if you do it to me on this, on this call, you're going to do it to yourself. God going to say go left and you're going to say go slightly left. He going to say, will you do something, yes or no? And you going to say, well, Lord, amen. He didn't say amen. He said yes or no. That's key. Following instructions is key. You got to do it precisely the way he say. Or it will not come out precisely the way he said it. Okay. You got me? The integrity to yourself then. I got my people. The integrity to myself is to apologize to yourself. Yeah, you have to have an agreement today with you. Today, I'm, I'm coming into an agreement with me. Today, I'm going to agree with myself. First of all, I'm going to apologize to myself. And you know why some of y'all think this is stupid right here? You think this is stupid because you know what? You don't think you're important. Isn't it somehow you can offend people and they demand an apology and you feel convicted and feel like you need to give it to them in order to make the relationship right? When you are offended with your, with your different elements of your own life and you don't deem yourself to be important enough to say, you know what, my bad, I'm sorry about that. I'm apologizing. 
I know it sounds crazy, but I'm just saying, y'all, I do it, and it works. I'm apologizing to my name. I'm apologizing to myself. I'm apologizing to God because of what he gave me. And, I, and then after you apologize, you have to become integral by saying, and I promise myself today that I would not go another day without operating in the sheer prudence of the Lord as it relates to the dream and the vision that God has given me. In Jesus' name, amen. That's the way that works. Because you have to release yourself of the guilt. You know how you feel the, the guilt come off of you when you apologize to somebody for something you've done wrong? You walk around in that yourself and don't even know it. You've learned to live with it so deeply subconsciously until it's become a, the, like the fiber of who you are and the way you operate and the way you feel every day. When no, if you're walking around in guilt and you don't have liberty then you don't have the freedom to create and your creativity will be shut down. So in order to release your creativity, you got to repent to yourself and you got to repent to God and you got to ask God to forgive you for not doing what he has told you to do. And then you got to get busy doing that. You may not be able to work on it five hours a day. You may not be able to work on it 10 hours a day. But you shouldn't let one day, and I'm going to say it like this, you better not let one day go by that you don't do something as it relates to being integral to the dream that God has given you. Are you listening? Well, my time is almost up. It's actually, it's really up. I just want to see in my notes here. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll close with that one. Good thought. Glad I had this. Um, there was a thought that came to my mind this morning when I woke up. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and how the misinterpretation of that, um, how that phrase can become misinterpreted. Um, when people say, well, the Lord says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And the way he gave that to me this morning he said, the only time that I will permit an individual to stand still is when they are in harmony with who they know me to be. I said, wow, God, wow. He said, I would allow them to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And when he said, be still and know that I'm God, he said, well, I need those two are connected. If you're going to be still, the only way that you are legitimately allowed to be still is when you are in the know of God. You're not just allowed just to do nothing and just to say, I ain't going to do nothing. I'm just sitting here doing nothing. No, because when you are still and you are in the know of God, you are in the know of God. You do know that even in my stillness, he is still working on my behalf. Something is working out in my behalf because my integrity, my mindset, and my spirit, and my emotions are in harmony with who I know God to be. And therefore, in my stillness, there is still movement. Wow, God, that's good. Wow, wow, wow. I'm sorry. Y'all got to give me a minute. I got to take that one in for myself. Oh, Jesus. Whew. Hmm. It's only in when you feel like ain't nothing happening and you get that minute where you feel like, well, I don't see nothing happening. That's when you are in violation of the steel act. Mm -hmm. We're going to call this the steel act. We're going to develop little things on, our, on, on this program at that three with me. That's the steel act. Mm -hmm. You are illegal in the steel act. If while you see nothing in your spirit, you are believing nothing. Wow. 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 
But when I am still and I know, then something is transpiring with my name on it. My God. Oh, Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I'm a new creation. So as long as I stay in him, creativity is always in operation. God, I get that. Well, y'all, that just took me down. Mm, that's my good day. That is my good day. I'm telling you, I believe in you. I trust the God in you. I trust that you're on here and you're going to turn it around. Well, I'm just looking for somebody. No. Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. Stop it. Stop that. Who going to help me? Stop it. Um, listen. I believe in you to turn it around. Get yourself up. Get your mind up. Get your integrity up. And let's go. You done heard me preach a video. Now it's time to go. I believe in you. You're bigger than who you are. You're smarter than you know. If you ever find out, out, out how smart you really are, it's going to scare you. You got all the potential in the world, or you wouldn't be on this telecast. You got all the potential in the world, or God would have no need to talk to you. You would be one of these people that don't even know what I'm on live. Some, somebody I read earlier, somebody said, I stumbled up on this. No, you didn't. It was divine purpose. Because it's not only your turn, it's your time. Do you hear me? I sincerely believe that. Somebody said, well, you know what? I know people put out videos and it's just a thought, like the two minutes. I'm not trying to do nothing in two minutes. It didn't take you two minutes to get in this mess. It didn't take you two minutes for your life to be bound up and feel like you've been stroked spiritually. Where only one side of you is working. That took time. And we got that kind of time. So I said, you don't have time. No, we got time. We got time because God has given us time because a keeper of time and the one who's able to set time back on a dial and the person that's able to keep time still like he did in the battle of Jehoshaphat. That's my God. That's the one I serve. I don't serve the one on the clock. I serve the one who's in control of what goes on that clock. And he's carving out this space and this time for us to get it together. To move in the purpose. He heard your cry. You said you wanted to go after your dream. Here it is. I'm here to walk you through it every single day. Monday through Friday. I'm going to be sitting right here. At three. And you're going to go to your dreams with me. That's right. And I'm going to develop. I'm going to post the email address. At three with me. So that you can give me your responses. You can give me your questions. And I'll read them and read your questions right here on the broadcast. And, um, and I wanted to say this. The only reason why I put up a post about sowing a seed. Because I read more than 20 that said, is there any way possible, Dr. Biden, but I can sow into your ministry. So right there below, right before every broadcast, the sow your seed is going to be right there. So this word can go around the world. I want to do something bigger and greater with what I'm doing here. But right now, I'm satisfied with sitting right here with you every day. You don't know the peace that I feel. You don't know the joy that I feel being able to speak directly in your lives and not just stand into a television camera and don't know who I'm talking to, but talking to real live people about real live issues and helping them to understand that anything is possible. With God, 